My computer has actually frozen the last one, so let's continue on. The most basic, basic difference between terrorism financing and money laundering involves the origin of the funds. Terrorist financing uses funds for an illegal political purpose, but the money is not necessarily derived from illicit proceeds. Okay, so that's the two bif difference there. Uh, you should definitely expect a question uh, for this. The purpose of laundering funds intended for terrorists is to support terrorist activities. The individuals responsible for raising the funds are, n are not the beneficiaries of the laundered funds. Okay, so that's another good independent difference. The money benefits terrorist activity. On the other hand, money laundering always involves the proceeds of illegal activity. The purpose of laundering is to enable the money to be used legally. The individuals responsible for the illegal activity are usually the ultimate beneficiaries of the laundered funds. Okay. From a technical perspective, the laundering methods used by terrorists and other criminal organizations are similar, although it would seem logical that funding from legitimate sources does need to be laundered. There is a need for the terrorist group to disguise a link between it and its legitimate funding sources. One reason is being that the continued and uncompromised future use of that source. In doing so, the terrorists use methods similar to those of criminal organizations, cash, that um, cash smuggling, structuring, purchasing, um, purchase of monetary instruments, wire transfers, and the use of debit, credit, and or prepaid cards. Yeah, prepaid cards were massively used in terrorism financing. That's probably the main reason why um, they had to basically make them like, you know, a money service business and, and they had to do AML. Um, the Hawala system, an informal value transfer system involving the international transfer of value outside the legitimate broker banking system, it's based on a trusted network of individuals, has also played a role in moving terrorist-related funds. In addition, money raised for terrorist groups is also used for mundane expenses such as food and rent and is not always strictly used just for the terrorist act themselves. Yeah, another thing they might use it for is like paying paying the families whose you know son committed a terrorist act, you know what I mean, looking after them. So there's a lot of funds. Detecting terrorist financing. In 2004, a monograph on terrorist financing of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States stated that neither the September 11 hijackers nor their financial facilitators were experts in the use of the international financial system. The terrorists created a paper trail linking them to each other and, uh, and their facilitators. Still, they were adept enough to blend into the last international financial system without revealing themselves as criminals. The money laundering controls in place at the time were largely focused on drug trafficking and large-scale financial fraud and were not sufficiently focused on the transactions engaged in by the hijackers. Since 9-11, international efforts to detect and deter terrorist financing have increased significantly. That is true. Conversely, in response to these efforts, terrorists and terrorist finances have adapted and expanding and varying their methods of raising and moving funds. So yeah, even if you, you ban them, criminals and terrorists and finances as well, they will they will innovate and get better. You know, so you gotta think of it that way. Um, all right, increasing the so yeah, so expanding and varying their methods of raising and moving funds, and increase requiring increased innovation and vigilance by law enforcement and financial institutions. Case study. What have we got here? The September 11 hijackers used U.S. and foreign financial institutions to hold, move, and retrieve their money. So just think about it for a second. When they had the September 11 attack, okay, they had to like these guys got trained as pilots. They had to they, they serious amounts of money needed to be able to move to be able to do this, you know. They deposited money into U.S. accounts, primarily by wire, and depositing the cash of travelers, checks brought from overseas. Several of them kept funds in foreign accounts as they accessed the United States through ATM and credit card transactions. The hijackers received funds from facilitators in Germany and in the United Arab Emirates as they, they transited Pakistan before coming to the United States. The plot cost Al-Qaeda somewhere in the range of four hundred dollars to $500,000, which approximately 300000 passed through the hijackers' bank accounts in the United States. While in the United States, the hijackers spent money primarily on a freight training, travel, and living expenses. Through the reconstruction of available financial information, the U.S. Bore Internal Revenue Service and U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation established how the hijackers responsible for the September 11 attacks received their money and how their money was moved into and out of their accounts. The 19 hijackers opened 24 domestic bank accounts at four different banks, so they were going all the way around. The following financial profiles were developed and the hijackers' domestic accounts. Account profiles. Accounts were opened with cash or cash equivalents in average amounts of 3000 to 5000 so under structuring. Identification used to open the accounts were visas issued through foreign governments. There were student visas studying at pilots. 
Uh, accounts were opened within 30 days of entry into the United States. Some of the accounts were joint accounts. Addresses used, uh, used were not permanent addresses, but rather were mailboxes and were changed frequently. The hijackers often used the same address and telephone numbers on the accounts. 12 hijackers opened the accounts at the same bank. So one of the banks was clearly susceptible and they all used it. Uh, transaction profiles, some accounts directly received and sent wires of small amounts to and from foreign countries such as the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Germany. The hijackers made numerous attempts to withdraw cash in excess of the limit of the debit card. Numerous balance inquiries were made. After a deposit was made, withdrawals occurred immediately. Overall, transactions were below the reporting requirements. We said that funding of the accounts was by cash and overseas wire transfers. ATM transactions occurred with more than one hijacker present, creating a series of transactions involving several hijackers at the same ATM. Okay, uh, Debit cards were used by hijackers who do not own accounts. International activity. While in the US, two of the hijackers had deposits made on their behalf by unknown individuals. Interesting. Hijackers on all four flights purchased traveler's checks overseas and brought them into the United States. Some of these traveler's checks were deposited into their US checking accounts. One of the hijackers received substantial funding through wire transfers into his German bank account in 1998 and 1999 from an individual. So it took a long time though with this thing. In 1999, the same hijacker opened an account in the UAE, giving power of attorney over to the account of the same individual who had been wiring money to his German account. So this wasn't questioned. It's very easy that this stuff wasn't questioned back then. You know, things changed a lot since 9 11. More than $100,000 was wired from the UAE account of the hijacker to the German account of the same hijacker in the 15-month period. So they're using a lot of Western countries to hire the money. So they're able to like layer it in like a small fashion. Just get the, the, the idea was look, let's just, just get our money to, to continental Europe or the UAE, where it's basically a Western country, and then wire it to the US from there. That was the layering they did. In an attempt to clarify terrorist financing and offers recommendations to the global financial community, FATF issued guidance to identify techniques and mechanisms used to use in financing terrorism. The report, entitled Guidance for Financial Institutions in Detecting Terrorist Activity, Financing, not Activity, <laughs> Financing, was published on April 2002. So you can tell after September 11th, all these institutions went crazy on terrorism financing. So, And described the general characteristics of terrorist financing. Its objective was to help financial institutions determine whether a transaction merits additional scrutiny so the institution is better able to identify, report when appropriate, and ultimately avoid transactions involving funds associated with terrorist activity. In the report, FATF suggested that financial institutions exercise reasonable judgment in evaluating potential suspicious activity to avoid becoming conduits for terrorism financing. Institutions must look out for, among other things, the following factors. So this is a very early stage, you know. Use of an account as a front for a person with suspected terrorist links. Appearance of an account holder's name on a list of suspected terrorists. Frequent large cash deposits in accounts of non-profit organizations. High volume of transactions in the account. Lack of clear relationship between the banking activity and the nature of the account holder's business. FATF suggested that with these scenarios in mind, financial institutions pay attention to some classic indicators of money laundering, including dormant low sum amounts that suddenly receive wire transfer deposits following a, by daily cash withdrawals that continue until the transaction sum is removed and lack of cooperation by the client requiring further information. Okay. How terrorists raise and move stored fund or store fund. Global sanctions efforts from have reduced funding to organizations from traditional state sponsors of terror, leading these organizations, those organizations to seek supplement sources of income and conduct their activities. In the December 2015 United Nations Security Council meeting, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon told the council terrorists take advantage of weakness in financial and regulatory regimes to raise, raise funds. They circumvent formal channels to avoid detection and exploit new technologies and tools to transfer, resor transfer resources. They have forged destructive and very profitable links with drug and criminal syndicates, among others. They then they abuse charitable causes to trick individuals to contribute terrorists, continue to adapt their tactics and diversify their funding sources, which he noted include raising money through oil trade, extortion, undetected cash careers, kidnapping for ransom, trafficking and human and arms racketeering. So a lot of terrorism financing, it's just a lot of crime as well, you know. Uh, let's go to use of Huala and other informal value transfer systems. Alternative remittance systems, ARSs or informal value transfer systems, are often associated with ethnic groups from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. So these informal value transfer systems are everywhere. They've got different names for them, but they're everywhere. 
ARS is commonly involved in international transfer of value outside the legitimate banking system and are based on trust. You're going to have questions about this in the ACAMS exam, 100%. The systems are referred to by different names, including upon the country Hawala, an Arabic word meaning tra change or transform, Hundi, uh, a Hindi word meaning collect, Chidi banking, referring to the way the system operates, Chop Chop banking in China, or Poi Kwan in Thailand. I, mean, I live in Thailand for a bit, I never saw it there, but it's definitely there. Hawala was created centuries ago, centuries ago in India and China before Western financial systems were established to facilitate the secure and convenient movement of funds. Merchant traders wish to send funds to their homeland would deposit them with a Hawala broker or Hawaladar who normally owned a trading business for a small fee. Hawaladar would arrange for the funds to be made available for withdrawal from another Hawaladar, normally also a trader in another country. The two Hawaladars would settle accounts through normal process of trade. Today, the process works much the same way with people in various parts of the world using their accounts to move money internationally for third parties. In this way, deposits and withdrawals are made through Hawala bankers rather than traditional financial institutions. They're, they're pretty sophisticated, these things. The third parties are normal immigrants or visiting workers who send small sums of to their homeland to avoid bank fees and wire transfers. Reason for legitimate use of Hawala and other IVTS include cheaper and faster money transmission, lack of banking access, this is probably the big one, lack of banking access, and is the rem in the remittance receiving country cultural preference and lack of trust in a formal banking system. There is usually no physical movement of currency and a lack of formality with regards to verification and record keeping. The money transfer, oh, 